Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk in general aviation with relevant news and flying tips for pilots and student pilots to help keep you safe. I'm Max Truscott. Once again, we've got a very full show. After the news, we'll talk about the $202 million crash of an F-22 Raptor fighter. And like most accidents, there were many small items in the accident chain that led to that crash. Later, I'll play audio from a seat rail incident that occurred during takeoff in a Cirrus SR-22 in which I was teaching. And then we'll talk with Jason Blair about the light gun test that colorblind pilots can take to restore their night privileges and several nuances to that test. Later, we'll have some of your emails and comments. Thanks so much for sending those, as I love hearing from you and sharing them on the show. Last week in episode 216, we had updates on the Learjet crash in San Diego, including ways to use the Garmin visual approaches in foreflight when circling to land. And we talked with Matt Lane about the free Virga app for entering Pyrep. So if you didn't hear that episode, you may want to check it out. And hey, it's still January when people make New Year's resolutions. And while you might give up on going to the gym next month, here's one resolution you can stick to for the full year. We're a listener-supported show and still ad-free. So make a resolution now to sign up to become a member of the show at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. And when you do, I'll read your name on the show. This week in the news... Teenage pilot completes a round-the-world flight in a microlight. The NTSB asks FAA to require CO detectors. And we have two tales of pilots who flew very low and whose statements had a dubious relationship to the truth. All this and more, and the news starts now. From FlyingMag.com, teenage pilot completes a round-the-world trip sets world record. 19-year-old Zara Rutherford became the youngest woman to fly around the globe solo and the first woman to do it in a microlight. 150 days after departing the Flanders International Airport in Belgium and after 68 stops around the globe, the 19-year-old arrived home last week. Rutherford is also the first woman to circumnavigate the globe in a microlight and the first person from Belgium to do it in a single-engine aircraft. The composite-built Shark Aero microlight that Rutherford flew is a high-performance two-seat tandem aircraft with a retractable gear and a two-blade variable-pitch propeller. It's powered by a Rotax 912 ULS 100-horsepower engine, which allows it to achieve cruise speeds of up to 140 knots, one of the fastest in its category. Rutherford said the goal of her trip was to encourage young women to pursue their dreams and bridge the gender gap in aviation, as well as in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Quote, only 5% of commercial pilots and 15% of computer scientists are women. In both areas, aviation and STEM, the gender gap is huge, she said. But during my journey, I met many incredibly talented women, pilots, engineers, car racers. I believe together we can make a real change. We can encourage other women to be bold, ambitious, and pursue their dreams. She said she only had 150 hours of flight time before she departed, and some of that came from ferrying airplanes across the Atlantic, for clients with her father, who's also a pilot. Rutherford initially planned to take 45 days to do the trip, but encountered operational and weather delays. She spent her Christmas in Singapore and reported that she'd be delayed again following a flat tire. After landing in Egelsbach, Germany on Wednesday for her second to last stop, she shared that coming from the Medesov airport in the Czech Republic was quite challenging. Quote, today was a pretty difficult flight. The clouds were pretty low and sometimes it took me some time to find the best and safe route forward, but reaching Egglesbach was great, and I'm so happy to be here. At a news conference, she spoke candidly about delays she faced in Siberia as a result of the cold weather, but it was more difficult to navigate around the equator because of thunderstorms that popped up all the time. There were also wildfires in Southern California. Quote, it got to a point I just couldn't see anything anymore. You could smell the smoke up to 10,000 feet. She plans to enroll in university in September to study engineering in either the U.S. or the U.K., depending upon where she's accepted. But before that, she looks forward to sharing her story with other girls. From avweb.com, NTSB asked FAA to require CO detectors for GA aircraft. The NTSB released a safety recommendation last week calling for FAA to require carbon monoxide or CO detectors in GA aircraft. In addition, the report specifies that the agency should require CO detectors that comply, quote, with an aviation-specific minimum performance standard with active oral or visual alerting. The recommendation applies to all enclosed cabin aircraft with reciprocating engines. 
The NTSB is concerned about the continued hazards resulting from CO poisoning because the FAA does not require CO detectors on enclosed cabin aircraft. The NTSB concludes that the use of a functional CO detector to alert a pilot through visual and auditory means to the presence of CO before the pilot's judgment is impaired is necessary to the continued safe operation of aircraft. The NTSB said it has identified 31 accidents attributed to CO poisoning between 1982 and 2020, 23 of which were fatal. Of those, it found that only one of the accident aircraft was equipped with any kind of CO detector. The board first asked the FAA to require CO detectors in GA aircraft with enclosed cabins and forward-mounted engines in 2004. From AOPA.org, coming soon, Super Bowl flight restrictions. Well, I guess it's that time of year again. If you're local to the area or plan to fly through the LA area on February 13th, the Wild Blue Yonder will not be business as usual thanks to the big game. The game, which takes place at the SoFi Stadium in Inglewood, California, will begin at about 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. GA and drone pilots should expect special traffic procedures, operational requirements, and TFRs around the area before, during, and after the Super Bowl. According to Jim McClay, AOPA Director of Airspace, Air Traffic, and Security, in addition to the national entertainment that the Super Bowl brings each year, it also provides one of the busiest air traffic events in the national airspace system. We encourage any pilots planning to operate in the area during the game to do thorough pre-flight planning and remain vigilant throughout the course of the event. Pilots are encouraged to check NOTAMs frequently to confirm they have the most current information. TFR information is published by FDC NOTAM normally three to five days prior to the event. TFR NOTAMs and graphics are available at the FAA TFR website. In addition to flight restrictions, the FAA is also discouraging training flights and solo student cross-country flights within 60 nautical miles of the LA International Airport. Practice approaches, touch-and-go landings, and other training operations may be limited or suspended. Special air traffic procedures will also be in effect for 13 larger airports in and around the L.A. area, including airports as far away as Henderson and North Las Vegas airports. For the full list of airports, check our show notes at aviationnewstalk.com 217. Also from avweb.com, Sporties launches new CFI portal. Sporties officially launched its new portal for CFIs last week as part of its 2022 pilot training platform. The Sporties CFI portal includes lesson plans, a CFI refresher course, a library of FAA publications, special CFI offers, and access to the company's pilot training courses. It also allows instructors to monitor their students' progress in Sporties pilot training courses. Quote, we designed the CFI portal as a platform to manage and organize students, monitor progress, and give instructors access to the tools and resources to help them in their teaching activity, said Eric Radke, Sporties Academy Chief Instructor. Given the popularity of home study resources, the portal also helps instructors and students stay engaged in the learning process and moving toward a common goal. All portal content is available for free to active flight instructors. In addition, Sporties noted that the 17-lesson online flight instructor refresher course, or EFERC, offered on the portal satisfies a requirement to renew a CFI certificate. The Sporties CFI portal can be found at sporties.com CFI. From AOPA.org, pilot ADSB errors decline. The FAA hopes outreach and education will reduce callsign mismatch events to zero. While the number of such events, which trigger alerts in ATC facilities and signal a regulation violation, has declined since ADSB out became mandatory in certain airspace on January 1, 2020, a significant number of aircraft continue to broadcast incorrect flight ID information in their ADSB out transmissions. An FAA webinar on the topic in August addressed GA pilots in particular, though call sign mismatch has also been an issue for commercial operators. In GA operations, there are two main reasons why the flight ID broadcast by an aircraft transceiver might not match the registration number of the aircraft on a filed flight plan. One of these relates to maintenance and the other to public benefit flying. Maintenance events that involve disconnecting the aircraft battery or otherwise cutting power to the ADSB transmitter can reset the transmitter to factory default settings, including the flight ID setting. Aircraft owners can request a public ADSB performance report through a secure form on the FAA website to confirm correct operation, though only for flight activity that has already been logged by the ADSB system. The FAA advises against asking tower controllers 
to confirm the aircraft's flight ID information is correct, partly because such requests clog the airways, and partly because many facilities have not enabled the full functionality that will allow diagnosis of flight ID mismatch yet. As those functions are more broadly enabled across the ATC network, more call sign mismatch events will trigger more alerts that distract controllers and will eventually raise the probability of enforcement action by the FAA. Just as it is illegal to disable ADSB out broadcast from an installed transceiver, broadcasting the wrong information can also violate FAR 91.227 in certain contexts. The other main reason for call sign mismatch events involving GA aircraft is failure to set or reset the ADSB transceiver to match call signs used during certain public benefit flight operations. Using a call sign such as Compassion on volunteer flights has many benefits. It alerts ATC that a pilot is on an important charitable flight, and it may grant access to special handling, which provides a measure of safety and security for passengers with special needs. However, an Air Care Alliance briefing on the topic notes that the use of call signs such as Compassion, CMF, and Angel Flight, and GF, and similar call signs, creates opportunity for mistakes that lead to call sign mismatch events. ADSB transceivers are usually programmed during installation to broadcast a flight ID that matches the aircraft registration number. Depending on the equipment, changing this value can be easy or somewhat more complicated. A significant number of call sign mismatch events occur when the pilot forgets to set or reset the flight ID parameter to match the call sign used on a filed flight plan. The FAA provided a list of 46 call sign mismatch events logged in December that involved aircraft flying public benefit missions on a filed flight plan that included a flight plan ID that did not match the ADSB out flight ID. Many volunteer operations use mission or organization specific call signs only on one leg of a round trip flight, creating more opportunities for a pilot to forget to set the box to match the filed flight plans. FAA staff noted that the issue has been handled to date with phone calls to aircraft operators but if it persists at a high rate, about 75 call sign mismatch events are noted every day, the agency is likely to take a harder line. And I think I see this quite often as I fly around. Just today I was flying and I noted an aircraft ADSB output, which was not showing that aircraft's call sign and it just said VFR. So that probably got accidentally reset during maintenance. From planeandpilotmag.com, Pipistrol introduces new already certified plane. Slovenian aircraft maker Pipistrol announced its latest aircraft model, which it's calling the Explorer. The model, which boasts a high-end panel among other advanced features, got the nod from EASA last week. If the Explorer looks familiar, well, good eye. The plane is the latest of several models of the family of planes Pipistrol referred to as the SW line of side-by-side -side light planes, all of which featured long sailplane-like cantilever wings and excellent visibility. The latest SW model, the SW-121, had been nicknamed the Virus, by the way that's spelled virus, which would lead one to guess the follow-up aircraft might be called Omicron. To deflect such childish jokes, Pipistrol has renamed the Virus the Legacy. The Explorer's certification is impressive. Yasa awarded type certification to the plane in the normal category, possibly because it uses a type-certificated engine, the Rotax 912, which the company points out can run auto gas. Under the type certificate, the Explorer is approved for day and night VFR, and it can be used as a glider tug, a popular use in Europe especially. The aircraft is approved for intentional spins. The federated as opposed to integrated systems feature dual screens, one on each side of the flight deck, Garmin displays and a navigator, digital ADSB transponder, Navcom, and what looks to be a Garmin G500 autopilot. By the way, I had to look up the word federated in this context. For avionics, apparently it means having a lot of separate individual boxes, often from different manufacturers, installed in the front panel of the aircraft, as opposed to having an integrated system, something like a Garmin G1000. It also boasts haptic stall warning, so that sounds something similar to a stick shaker. A whole airplane ballistic parachute recovery system, a hydraulically actuated constant speed prop, and air brakes. Under its EASA certification, the Explorer can be operated for commercial uses, and Pepistrol calls it the ideal solution for pilot training. And I went out to the company's website. It says the more adventurous owners will appreciate that the Explorer can easily be dismantled in less than 15 minutes and stored in a dedicated trailer. A normal car can tow the aircraft in the trailer, should this be desired, and a hangar is not needed. No word on the pricing of the Explorer aircraft. 
From AOPA.org, clearance phraseology confusion noted. ATC controllers called to AOPA's attention an apparent misunderstanding of phraseology involving RNAV instrument departures that has led to unwelcome surprises. The issue was reported by controllers in Florida, though it could happen at any airport where a published RNAV Standard Instrument Departure Procedure, or RNAV SID, includes a route with multiple waypoints. As the National Business Aviation Association recently reported, the addition of new RNAV SIDs that enable simultaneous RNAV departures from parallel runways has led to confusion. The procedures used at many large airports with parallel runways route traffic through distinct waypoints used with specific runways. ATC issues takeoff clearances that are phrased like this example. RNAV to Goham, wind 360 at 5, runway 36 left, cleared for takeoff. This does not mean that ATC expects the pilot to fly direct to Goham in this example. Rather, ATC expects pilots to fly the Goham procedure as published, as explained in the Aeronautical Information Manual. Quote, the purpose of the advisory is to remind pilots to verify the correct procedure is programmed in the FMS before takeoff. Pilots must immediately advise ATC if a different RNAV SID is entered in the aircraft's FMC. When this advisory is absent, pilots are still required to fly the assigned SID as published. The AIM notes that the SID transition is not restated because the clearance is a clearance to fly a published route. An aircraft cleared to use an RNAV SID that begins with a vector to a waypoint will be assigned a heading before departure. Also from AOPA.org, volatile supply chain tightens grip on aviation industry. Aircraft engine and avionics manufacturers are among many companies around the world facing difficult supply chain dilemmas as a result of the ongoing pandemic. The pandemic has forced several companies, including aircraft manufacturers, to get creative in the ways they do business. Yakima, Washington-based Cub Crafters is among the companies reporting similar issues. Quote, there was one point where we were having trouble getting the aluminum extrusions that we use for lift struts and wing spars. The mill that had the tooling and would run the extrusions was on the East Coast, but they couldn't get any of the certified aluminum ingots from the foundry in order to be able to run these aviation parts for us, said Brad Dam, Cupcrafters VP of Sales and Marketing. We found some of the raw material in Los Angeles, but because of the truck driver shortage and everything else, there was no way to pay someone to move that material to the East Coast. So we sent some of our manufacturing employees down to LA to buy that raw material, put it in the back of a rental truck, and drive the ingots to a mill on the East Coast that was able to run our order. These are for critical parts. You can't build airplanes without lift struts. You can't build airplanes without wing spars. Dam also explained that he hoped customers who have maybe been a little annoyed that they've gotten their airplanes late or are waiting on an airplane from us will see that Cub Crafters is going to incredible lengths to produce and deliver aircraft in really challenging times. Cirrus Aircraft, which just announced its latest SR series of aircraft January 11th, is also facing industry-wide supply chain dilemmas. Quote, Cirrus is anticipating continued supply chain volatility for the next 12 to 18 months, said Pat Waddick, Cirrus President of Innovation and Operations. Demand is robust, placing a growing burden on the entire supply chain, and Cirrus Aircraft is working to mitigate these challenges. Overall, Cirrus is making positive strides with strategic business growth plans, continuous hiring initiatives, and proactive supply chain management. Avidyne, a competitor to Garmin, is also dealing with suppliers withdrawing from their component delivery commitments. Quote, it's basically essentially unprecedented what has happened in the electronic supply chain, which is that long-standing commitments for components from suppliers to companies like us that use those components have been completely broken across the board, stated Avidyne CEO Dan Schwinn. Schwinn told AOPA that before the pandemic, the company would order 12 or 18 months worth of parts, but now it is impossible to determine whether the supplier will have the part or know when the part will become available. In some cases, Schwinn was told that specific components would not be available until 2024, or in worst cases, the component may not ever become available again. In addition to supply chain shortages and sharp increases in cost, Dynon Avionics is facing another issue, the labor market. Quote, it's probably never been tougher to find great people in the pandemic environment, said Dynon Director of Marketing Michael Schofield. Labor shortages are not only a problem for the avionics side of the industry, but also for the engine side. Continental Aerospace is having a difficult time finding candidates to fill open positions. Quote, we are having issues finding the ideal candidate to join our team, the statement said. We are genuinely looking to have the right people in the right seats, and we're fortunate to have many of those individuals already on our team, 
working on current and future projects. And from the NTSB.gov, the preliminary NTSB report is out on the crash that we talked about two weeks ago of a Cessna in Southern California that got demolished by a train. If you wondered how that plane ended up on the tracks, we learn a little more about that here. According to the report, the pilot departed runway 12 at Whiteman Airport on a VFR local flight. Shortly after takeoff, during the initial climb, the pilot initiated an emergency landing and touched down on an asphalt surface highway about 265 feet west of the runway centerline and about 50 feet beyond the airport's southernmost perimeter. During the accident sequence, the plane collided with a railroad crossing arm and subsequently came to rest on an active northbound-southbound railroad track. The airplane came to rest with its nose oriented generally to the east. The airplane sustained damage to the forward left fuselage, the left wing, and the left wing lift strut. Additionally, the left main landing gear and the nose landing gear had separated from the airplane. Bystanders and law enforcement officers extricated the pilot from the airplane. Seconds later, the airplane was struck by a passenger train that was traveling southbound. The train's engine struck the airplane's left wing and aft fuselage. And of course, it resulted in some of the most dramatic plane crash video that I've ever seen, and we'll have links to that video in our show notes. Also from AOPA.org, CBD can be risky for pilots. CBD or cannabidiol products have become increasingly popular in media, but for pilots, the risk these products pose far outweigh their possible benefits. CBD is the second most prevalent active ingredient in cannabis or marijuana, Derived from the hemp plant, CBD has been touted for its wellness benefits without the psychoactive response of THC, the main active ingredient in cannabis. CBD product production is currently unregulated, and its use in fruit products is not approved by the FDA. That said, CBD can be found in many personal hygiene, wellness, and consumable products around the country. CBD is considered a non-psychoactive compound, but can legally have trace amounts of THC up to 0.3%. That's not enough to cause a psychoactive response, but is enough to show up on drug tests, which currently can't differentiate between THC and CBD. Regardless of state laws, THC is still a Schedule I illicit substance in the eyes of the federal government, and with that, the FAA has a zero-tolerance policy. And because drug tests can't tell the difference between THC and CBD, pilots who are suspected of using THC accidentally through CBD or otherwise, can be subject to certificate revocation, while a positive drug test following an accident could even jeopardize insurance coverage. The FAA's application for a medical certificate requires the pilot to report any and all positive drug tests, whether administered at the federal, state, or local level, or by a private employer. With a recent uptick in CBD popularity and the risk its consumption can cause to aviators, pilots everywhere have taken the social media to post images of accidental CBD exposure or near exposure. Pilots found CBD in everything from shampoo to water and cocktails. For pilots, avoidance is recommended when it comes to any CBD products. It's helpful to become aware of other common CBD terminology like full or broad spectrum and read product labels carefully, including the ingredients. And I heard a related story a couple of weeks ago when I was participating in a seminar with uh, Cirrus. One of their employees said that they had come across a pilot who thought that he was suffering from carbon monoxide and had done a precautionary landing. And it turned out instead that he had picked up some edibles in the kitchen that his daughter had left around, and he was not aware that it included some uh, active ingredients in it. So be careful in what you're eating. And we've got a couple of plane crash stories. This first one comes from the KenoshaNews.com in Wisconsin. Small plane crashes into fuel tanker truck before takeoff. A plane crash near Sylvania Airport last week left the plane, a single-engine Cessna, heavily damaged. The pilot, identified by Racine County Sheriff's Office as a 79-year-old white male from Waterford, was conscious and breathing when fire responders arrived. Flight for Life was called to the scene and took the man to the hospital. The initial investigation indicates that the plane crashed into a fuel tanker truck prior to taking off. All the plane appeared to have been leaking fuel. No fires were reported, avoiding what could have been a or dangerous situation. According to the sheriff's office, deputies were able to determine that prior to liftoff, the plane's wing struck the fuel tanker truck, which spun the plane around and caused the airplane to crash head-on into the truck. And now we have our two stories of pilots who were flying low and have a little bit of trouble with the truth. This comes from flyingmag.com, trouble flying low upon the Suwannee River. 
On January afternoon in 2017, a sport pilot, 61, flew his amateur-built Buccaneer Amphibian from the Orlando, Florida area to Blue Springs State Park in Orange City to meet a friend and camp there beside the Suwannee River. The two-seat airplane, powered by a pylon-mounted 80-horsepower Rotax, had been built in 1992. The pilot had purchased it from the builder nine months before. The pilot, who had not visited the area before, flew up and down the river for some time, looking for his friend. When he located him, he landed northward on a straight segment of the 100-yard-wide river and tied up at a boat dock. Learning that his friend was about to go downstream on a paddleboard to hunt for a dog's life jacket that had fallen into the water, the pilot said he would help in the search after he had unloaded his gear from the plane. A short time later, the buccaneer took off northward, made a 180-degree left turn, and dropped down to treetop level to follow the river downstream. In the meantime, the paddler had retrieved the life jacket and was making his way back toward the campsite. His view was obscured by trees at a bend in the river, but he heard the airplane's engine stop suddenly. An eight-year-old boy saw the accident from upriver nearly a mile away. He said that the airplane was flying below the tops of the trees lying in the riverbanks when suddenly it flipped over backwards and fell into the water. It took the paddler and another would-be rescuer three to four minutes to reach the airplane. It lay inverted in shallow water. They tried to extricate the pilot, but he was already dead from impact injuries. Directly above the wreckage, several power lines crossed the river. Their presence is indicated on the Jacksonville sectional chart. There was nothing, no pennants, no red balls, to enhance the visibility of the wires themselves, but then there was little reason to expect a 40-foot-tall boat or a low-flying airplane to pass by. However, a conspicuous 100-foot-wide clear-cut swath marked the trail of the wires through the forest on both sides of the river. The NTSB confined its determination of the probable cause to the pilot's, quote, failure to see and avoid power lines while flying at low altitude. The NTSB's public docket on the accident supplies a few interesting details. The pilot and his friend were acquainted through the local hang gliding community and Facebook. The friend described his pilot as an icon in the community and experienced with 9,000 or 10,000 hours in light sport aircraft. But when looking at the pilot's recent medical certificate applications in 2014, he reported 982 hours of flight experience. Two years later, he reported 8,000 hours. By the time the information reached his friend, his time had swelled even further. Flying at low altitude is enjoyable, but is also dangerous. Part of the danger is that you will fail to notice an obstruction. Part is that you are turning over some of the control of your flight path to the whims of the terrain. But the most serious danger is that if you make a mistake, you will have little time or space in which to correct it. And the article finished up by saying, in a similar accident that occurred just nine months after this one, a Cessna 172 collided with power lines 40 feet above the Mississippi River near Ramsey, Minnesota. The 300-hour pilot, 47, most probably failed to see the power lines, although they were marked by red balls, because he was coming around a bend in the river and facing the evening sun. The NTSB included the pilot's personality among the causes of the accident. He was known to be a person who could not resist the impulse to do reckless things and brag about them later. His instructor urged him to cool it, and at one point sardonically suggested that if he intended to die in an airplane crash, he should at least not take his wife and son with him. On this flight, he took only his wife. And our second low-flying pilot story comes from timeslive.co.za, which is in South Africa. It says a pilot taking three passengers on a sightseeing flight over Pretoria flew so dangerously low over a road that he severed an overhead power line with a propeller. The pilot also shown his landing light at oncoming vehicles on the M35 highway. The four-seat Cessna 172 was rented from Ega Air Flight School, and it survived the collision with the power cable. But according to the CAA report, the pilot asked his passengers to lie about what happened and to blame a student pilot who flew the plane the previous day for the damage to the propeller. The report said the rented aircraft also exceeded its maximum takeoff weight by 5%. It said the plane struck a power line while the pilot was flying the aircraft at a very low height over a road, endangering the safety of the aircraft, the occupants, and property. The pilot said 30 minutes after taking off, he felt something in the aircraft and heard a noise. He checked the performance of the aircraft as well as the flight controls before deciding to land for a thorough inspection. Upon seeing no damage, he concluded he must have entered an air pocket and took off again with his three passengers. One of the passengers, a private pilot, told the investigator they had descended to about 50 to 100 feet above the ground, flew over an open field, then followed a road. While he was above the road, he flashed the landing light onto the oncoming traffic on the road. It was during this period that the aircraft propeller severed what they believed to be power lines. 
The private pilot said the aircraft shuddered, then there was a bang and a flash of bright white light. After this, the pilot in command tested the flight controls. No anomalies were detected, and all instrument parameters were normal. After landing, the pilot in command noted the damage to the propeller. He then asked the passengers that the blame should be shifted onto the student pilot who flew the aircraft the previous day. An inspection of the plane found evidence of wire markings on the exhaust, as well as the lower left main gear strut. The CAA report noted that the pilot's failure to make any entry in the flight folio after the flight, even though he was aware of damage to the propeller, was in contravention of civil aviation regulations. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up next, my seat rail incident and the report on the F-22 Raptor crash. Then we'll be talking with Jason Blair about the light gun test for colorblind pilots. And finally, we'll have more of your feedback and questions all right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. Now let me tell you about a seat rail incident that occurred to me in late December. I was flying in an SR-22 with the owner of that aircraft, and on our first takeoff, his seat slid back as we were taking off. I had my uh, iPhone in my left hand because I was videotaping the takeoff. My right hand is where it always is for takeoff, which is about an inch behind the side stick. And so, so when the seat slid back, my right hand was already in position the aircraft pitched up about 14 degrees in about 1.3 seconds. So it went up pretty suddenly and I already had taken control of the aircraft by the time that either he or I was able to say, I've got the controls. I have released this as a video to our Patreon supporters at the $20 and up level. So they've already seen the video, but here's a portion of the audio. First, the initial incident itself. And then about two minutes later, uh, I then started having a conversation with a pilot about what he experienced. Now, after the initial takeoff, we didn't talk about it for two minutes because we were departing and it made more sense to focus on the task at hand, which was climbing and exiting the, the class Delta. The first thing you'll hear him saying is, whoa, because we were bouncing ever so slightly in one of the bumps on the runway. And then the next thing is you'll hear me saying, whoa, 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 as the aircraft suddenly pitched up. So here's what it sounded like. Whoa. Whoa, whoa. I got no it. Controls. I got it. Wow. That sucked. Yeah, it's the first time that's ever happened in flight for me. Yep, seat slipped. And then about two minutes later, as we were passing through 2,700 feet, we had this conversation. All right, I'm recording again. So you said... That was not good at all. Nope, sure wasn't. Now it looked to me like the aircraft was starting to go a little bit left, and you said something before I heard the seat go back. Tell me what you heard and felt and experienced. Yeah, so I think initially uh, what was going on is it was just, it was trying to lift. It was trying to lift off. Yep. Um, and maybe because the the pavement is a little bit uneven. Right. Uh, so I was trying to push the nose down. Right. Um, and I was also holding um, right rudder. I think on this plane, you got to uh, add a lot of right rudder. Yep. And right when we, here. right when we were taking off, um, probably a few feet off the ground, I felt that it slipped. Yeah. I wonder if it started to slip a little bit when you pushed forward on the uh, the stick just to keep it on the ground. We need two Fox runway number two, follow to Tarbia, half mile final runway one three. Because yeah. I heard you say something before I heard the uh, yeah, that was different. The seat, the the seat going back. Yeah. yeah, that was different. Um, it was it was it was basically bouncing. Oh, okay. So you're saying that uh, because of the bumps in the uh, the runway, yeah, you were kind of commenting because of the bumps. Yeah. Yep. Let's go this way. Yep. Makes sense to me. We'll go around the clouds here. Well, and so what uh, do you think one should do? Um, I think, you know, the uh, the one solution I remember is hit the, the, the level button. Yep. Uh, that's really, I think, the only thing you can do. Yeah, and I guess the other thing is just to make triply sure that uh, the you push the handle down hard to uh, push it into the hole and don't just kind of release yeah. it gently where it might not fully seat in the hole. 
Yeah. Well, it's a beautiful day out there. I think we both would have uh, missed these great views in the future if that had ended in disaster. Yeah. Um, but uh, totally worth uh, looking at the pins again. Yep. And maybe replacing the pins. Well, it's interesting because this has just gone through an annual as well as an inspection, so either there's a problem that wasn't caught or or something. So I guess that raises the question, what can you do to mitigate a sliding seat? Obviously, uh, the best thing is to make sure the seat is fully locked before you take off. I have a CSIP friend who had the first incident I had ever heard of of a seat sliding back in a Cirrus, and that was last year. He mentioned that he was barely able to touch the level button as his seat slid all the way back, and he thinks that saved his life. He told me that now before every flight, he stuffs his survival gear bag behind his seat so that it can't slide back. He also said he would have the seat rails replaced during his next annual. Now to make sure my seat is fully locked in place, I always have wiggled in my seat just to make sure that the spring-loaded pin is fully seated. After our incident, I sat in the pilot seat, wiggled in the seat, and could feel the pin drop down. Then I was able to push the seat lever down with my hand, and I was surprised to see how much further down I could push the pin into the seat rail hole. So regardless of what kind of aircraft you fly, Please make sure that the seat is fully locked before takeoff. Okay, now let's talk about that loss of an F-22. This article came from the airforcetimes.com. It came out a couple of days ago. It says, Florida crash of high-tech F-22 blamed on human error, glitches, and tape. And it says, damage from the May 2020 crash at Eglin Air Force Base was estimated at $202 million. It was one of nine major Raptor mishaps in fiscal 2020. Several mistakes, including maintenance, pilot, and technology errors, plus a wayward piece of tape combined to cause a May 2020 plane crash in the Florida Panhandle that totaled an F-22 Raptor fighter, according to the results of an Air Force investigation. Redacted results of a commander-directed inquiry into the $202 million incident obtained by the Air Force Times via the Freedom of Information Act sheds the most light so far on what was behind the crash of one of the nation's most advanced airframes, at the Eglin Air Force Base training range. Air Force Times first reported in October 2021 that the F-22 grew increasingly wobbly upon takeoff, then refused to turn left and barrel rolled into the ground after the pilot safely ejected. The service said last year that mismanaged cleaning of the jet caused its demise, but didn't offer further details. It was one of nine major F-22 mishaps in fiscal 2020. The unnamed pilot involved in the May 15, 2020 crash was a captain serving as the 43rd Fighter Squadron's Assistant Operations Director. The 43rd Fighter Squadron is the only Air Force unit that provides initial and requalification training for active duty Air National Guard and Air Force Reserve F-22 pilots. Problems began two days earlier when maintainers towed in the advanced fighter jet for its monthly wash to help prevent corrosion. A crew chief was tasked with managing the wash team of four maintainers to ensure they correctly cleaned the jet. The crew chief periodically checked in on their work, but didn't stay throughout the process and inspected the plane once the wash was done, the report said. According to the technical order or maintenance manual that tells airmen how to wash the Raptor, a supervisor needs to watch over and participate in the cleaning, but the only team member with training in that role didn't know who the designated supervisor was supposed to be, neither did the other three airmen. Hurricane Michael, the Category 5 hurricane, that forced F-22s to relocate from Tyndall Air Force Base to nearby Eglin Air Force Base in 2018 was partly to blame. Quote, the discipline and standardization of conducting washes in this unit suffered when operations moved from Tyndale Air Force Base to Eglin Air Force Base after Hurricane Michael, the report said. Airmen saw no problems during routine pre-flight checks run before and on the day of the crash, though it's unclear how thoroughly the jet was inspected. They missed something crucial. Maintainers need to cover up electronics on the outside of an aircraft that could be damaged by water before they start a wash. But airmen left tape on a part of the F-22's air data system, known as a beta port, that no one caught before the jet took flight. The port, manufactured by Collins Aerospace, is one of multiple pieces that collect and process information about a plane's activity. Then they send those figures to a flight control system that uses the data to tell the plane how to adjust. A series of human and technical issues quickly piled up. While the jet was still on the runway, 
an alert popped up to tell the pilot that something was amiss with the flight control system. The pilot ignored it and continued to climb. A new emergency procedure, instituted for the F-22 just 15 days before the crash, told pilots to abort takeoff if a flight control system advisory came up during departure. The pilot, who would soon face that exact situation, did not review the updates before signing off on the new file and wasn't aware of the changes to the emergency protocol the investigation found. An official in charge of F-22 standards had pinged airmen on the Slack chat app to let them know the flight manual had changed, but pilots aren't required to read Slack messages, nor do they have to read the new material on their tablets in order to accept an updated flight manual. If the pilot had aborted the takeoff, the aircraft would have avoided the flying environment that depended on the left beta port providing reliable air pressure data, the report said. A week after the accident, multiple other pilots' tablets hadn't been updated with the new flight manual either. Colonel Jonathan King, the Accident Investigation Board president, said in the report, quote, in my opinion, poor technical order distribution practices failed to proactively notify the F-22 community of the existence of a new publication and any critical flight safety changes contained in the new version. This factor substantially contributed to the mishap. When asked whether the incident has spurred any changes to how airmen learn of manual revisions, Captain Sarah Johnson, a spokesperson for the 325th Fighter Wing, said the organization, quote, follows Air Force guidance and procedures for technical order updates. While airborne, the tape interfered with the port's ability to sense where the F-22 was in the air and gathered wrong information about the plane's position. The jet showed the pilot an altitude and airspeed that were off by about 1,000 feet and 40 knots, or 46 miles per hour, the report said. Typically, redundancies built into an F-22 allow it to still fly even when one component isn't working. The flight control system can determine which part is providing false data and turn it off according to the report. However, that backstop didn't kick in because the pilot was moving faster and at a steeper angle than what constitutes the F-22's, quote, happy place. The term refers to flying at no more than 1G, 400 knots, or 20 degrees up, Yet, this jet was climbing at 480 knots, 5.5 Gs, and 55 degrees. The pilot was aware of the flight control system's happy place, but did not think about it during the departure, the report said. Flight controls had permanently shut off one component of the air data system while the plane left the runway. Because the tape was interfering with another component, causing the jet to roll, the flight controls turned off a second piece of the sensor system to adjust for the pressure changes. At this point, it was no longer possible for the pilot to recover the aircraft safely, the report said. If he had stayed within the plane's happy place and reset the flight controls, the F-22's computer would have instead shut down the taped-off beta port to cut off the faulty data. The aircraft would have been sufficiently controllable to perform a safe landing, the report said. F-22 manufacturer Lockheed Martin ran the scenario through a simulator about 100 times. Each time, the report said, the plane's wobbly departure caused the flight controls to turn off part of the air data sensors. Johnson declined to answer whether anyone was disciplined for their mistakes that day, citing privacy concerns. She said, quote, The wing remains focused on a maintenance culture that ensures assigned aircraft and equipment are safe, serviceable, and properly configured to meet mission needs. Witness testimony revealed that clear violations have occurred during other F-22 washes, too, the report said. Johnson told Air Force Times that shoddy cleaning protocols haven't caused any other Raptor malfunctions. Now, this is kind of interesting. It sounds a little bit like normalization of deviance. So it sounds like there was a culture that allowed people to violate the standard for these washes because nothing ever seemed to happen, of course, until something did one time, which is why it's so important for us to pilots to always follow our standard operating procedures. Getting back to the story, the Air Force lost a B-2 Spirit Bomber in 2008 due to a similar issue. In that case, rain interfered with the air data sensor upon takeoff and sent the stealth aircraft plummeting to the ground. In the F-22's accident aftermath, the 43rd Fighter Squadron made some internal adjustments to provide more oversight on aircraft washes, Johnson said. She did not provide further details. The coronavirus pandemic contributed to the decay of robust maintenance practices as well. Leaders at the 43rd Fighter Squadron and the 325th Aircraft Maintenance Squadron each broke into two teams and began switching between in-person and telework every other week. Most meetings to include pilot meetings were canceled or held virtually in accordance with COVID-19 mitigation directives, the report said. This disrupted the normal flow of communications and learning. 
In total, the F-22 mishap cost more than $202 million in damages, including the $201.6 million aircraft, two CAT-M9 air intercept training missiles valued at $32,000 apiece, and $850,000 in environmental cleanup cost. So I think this shows, like most accidents in general aviation, there is a chain of events that occur, and all it takes is to recognize when the first one or two things goes wrong and to correct to break that chain from occurring. In this case, the accident error chain resulted in cost of over $200 million. And now let's move on to our conversation with Jason Blair. First, let me tell you a little bit about Jason. He's an FAA DPE or designated pilot examiner who gives check rides to pilots, and he's also an active flight instructor. He writes for both flying and plane and pilot magazines. He's the past executive director of NAFI, the National Association of Flight Instructors, and he serves on a number of industry committees. And he's one of our supporters, of course, who donates money each month through patreon.com to support the Aviation News Talk podcast. He's been on some of our most popular episodes, giving me a mock check ride. So if you have an instrument, private, or commercial check ride coming up, you might want to listen to episode 129, 139, or 149, respectively. Now here's our conversation with Jason Blair. Jason, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm excellent. I got to go flying last night. So, I mean, how much better can it be when you get to go flying on Christmas Eve? And it's 50 degrees in Michigan. And speaking of night, we'll be uh, talking quite a bit about that here in a moment. Let's start by talking about the general category of special medical tests. What are those and why do pilots end up needing them? Sure, Max. And this used to be something that only the FAA would do. It was always an FAA inspector that would show up and do these things. In recent time, really over the last uh, six months or so, they have started allowing examiners, the FAA DPEs, to do some of these tests. And they can be for a variety of things. Most commonly, it's for vision-related challenges, any type of uh, you know limitation somebody might have if they have a disability. It might be a you know if they have one leg or they're they're down to one eye or they might be having one arm. All of these things are things that we still have the option to certify somebody as a pilot for, although sometimes there are some limitations that are placed on their medicals when, we, when they do that. So these are things that now an examiner may be tasked with doing on behalf of the FAA to help a, a person who's trying to get that pilot certificate with some sort of unique challenge completed. And, and we go out and um, do very much like we would for a practical test, a lot of the same paperwork that goes with it because we couldn't do this without some paperwork, right? But we get to watch somebody demonstrate those skills and see if we can issue them a, uh, a medical. We're not the ones issuing the medical. We're doing the special flight test, but we then report that back to the medical office and uh, they go ahead and use the information gathered from us to determine what and, and how the medical might be issued for somebody. Well, and let me have you explain this for especially student pilots who may not have had a medical uh, yet. Uh, talk a little bit about the vision, color vision, and why that's particularly important in night flying. Sure. And I think this is, you know, let's even start a little further back. Many student pilots, especially who are, are doing this for a career, are told, hey, go out and get that first class medical right away before you ever start all of that training, right? And there's a reason for that. And the reason is we want to make sure that we don't have any medical hiccups that might cause somebody some challenges. If you're going to want a career as an airline pilot or charter pilot or, you know, a bush pilot or whatever it happens to be, a professional CFI even, right? So we want to make sure you can get a medical that is not going to be restricted in a way that would not allow you to do that job. But if you do that right away, you take that opportunity away for you to get two or three or four years down and multiple check rides and sometimes tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars into your training before we run into that hiccup that says, hey, um, I don't know if we can make you a, a commercial pilot because there's a medical limitation. So it's obviously a little bit more obvious if somebody has a larger physical disability. You know, if we have somebody who's you know missing both their legs and they want to become a pilot, well, that person's probably going to be limited to being a private pilot and have some special tools that they would use with the airplane. But if somebody is, you know, having some of the other concerns, maybe we have a little peripheral deficiency in an eye or, or what we're kind of going to be talking about a little bit here is some color blindness issues. Those are things that do affect somebody's medical and might affect whether or not they could get a medical above third class and second and first class, which might be something they would need to be a, a you know commercial pilot or an airline pilot. This becomes especially pertinent at nighttime where some of the colors are a little harder. And, and let's be honest, Max, from a statistical standpoint, those of us guys, we tend to be a little bit more susceptible 
susceptible to the color vision issues than the gals do. So we, we see more of this in men than we do in women. And this is something that, uh, you know, you're going to be tested on on every medical, right? We've all who've done medical so far have read those those obscure, really hard to read squiggly lines and colors and tried to come up with it. And uh, I think every time we take one of those, we all kind of look at it and go, man, I hope I gave the right answer, right? Yes, absolutely. I have read that uh, genetically speaking, you know, men are predisposed to color blindness and something on the order of 10% of us have some percentage of degradation in our ability to perceive color. And you're right. Every time I take that test, it's like, okay, I got that one. Ooh, this one I need to stare at for quite a while before I finally see the, the number that emerges. And every time I take the test, I think, boy, I just need to memorize these numbers. And of course, there are far too many <laughs> numbers to, uh, to memorize. But yes, this has got to be a real challenge for someone who's looking for a career as a pilot. Talk about the restriction that would go on your third class initially if you don't pass the colorblind test. Sure. And what we find many times is somebody who has identified in their medical that there is some color deficiency. And what most commonly happens is there's a a deficiency of shades that somebody can see might be differentiating between shades of a similar color, right? And I'll come back to that a little bit in a moment here. And, And what happens is there is typically a limitation placed on their medical and it might say something to the effect of not valid for flight at night or to a location where light gun signals are required, right? So, you know, this would be an example of you either can't fly at night, or if you were flying to a place where you didn't have a radio and you were dependent on on light guns to get your communication, I know there's not a whole lot of this anymore, but it, but it could be something, that pilot would be prohibited from doing that based on the medical. So once that restriction is put on the medical, they may choose then to try and get that restriction removed through a medical process. Yep. So I have stood at the airport uh, years ago with someone who was kind of of doing a pretest to see, hey, can I see those light gun signals? Talk about the signal light gun test that you've conducted for for pilots and anybody who's listening might uh, be interested in taking one if they if they have a restriction for night flying. Sure. And this is kind of brand new to me. I've done a couple of these now and, and not all of the examiners out there are authorized. We had to get and get trained on what we should be doing, what we end up doing. And there's there's FAA guidance on this and the FAA order 8900.1, same ones that the FAA inspectors use. We are told exactly how to do this. And it says very specifically, thou shalt go to a place approximately 1500 feet from the control tower. It must have a clear vision path to the tower. And, uh, and ask the tower to shoot you some light gun signals and and hopefully you can identify them. And what we do when we do these tests is we have, and there's actually a job aid in there where we have a a table and it says, have the tower shoot 10 signals. And in many cases, we we let them mix it up, but they're supposed to shoot all of the colors and, and we see what somebody gets. And the applicant is to respond with what color they saw. Hopefully we see the same color that they did because that means we're, we're seeing what the tower is actually shooting. Obviously, the examiner has to not be colorblind to be able to do this. So, you know, when we see the color, if they shoot a green and and I see green and the applicant says green, we're doing good. This is a very answer dependent test. And and I I advise people when they're taking this to take it very seriously. The first test is done during the daytime and we get 10 color lights and we move on. This is kind of a jeopardy test. You have one try. And if any of the colors are not correct, that is a failure of the whole test. Okay. So, you know, think about this. This isn't like a practical test where if you go out and you botch your short field landing, hey, we come back, we try it another day. This is a one and done. So it is really kind of important, I think, for people who are considering this or might need it. Go practice. See if you can see those colors, you know, call a tower up and go stand at a spot and see if, you know, you're actually seeing the colors take a witness with you so that, you know, if you see green and they see green, you at least know you're seeing the same thing. But make sure you know what you're doing because it it can absolutely have medical effects. When somebody does not pass this, it may make them ineligible beyond this forever for a second or first class medical. A failure of the test during the daytime is allowable to be retested at nighttime, okay? So somebody who doesn't pass during the day, 
it's obviously a little harder to see those colors during the day with with bright sun they might be able to see it at night and they could get that night restriction removed if they go out do the test at night and see the colors sufficiently but it would typically limit them to a third class medical at that point so you know you might get to do your private pilot stuff you could uh, do a third class medical and be a cfi at that point but it might prohibit you from being able to fly commercially as uh, you know somebody at an airline or a charter or something like that if you do not pass that during the daytime so it, it really is something i think it's important if somebody's got to do this that you know what you're getting into and and it, it is important go look at the fa guidance you know it's very specific with how we do these we're going to do it at 1500 feet we're going to do 10 colors you're going to see a color for five seconds and you're going to have one minute between colors we have to give you time to answer and then we document what you saw. As an examiner, my report then gets sent back to the FAA, my managing specialist, and then they they feed that back to the medical office that was authorizing the test to be done. That's interesting. I think I used to believe that the test had to be done at night. Essentially, you're telling me the test gets done in the day. If you pass it in the day, you're done, you're good, right? Correct. Okay. Now, you've come across something that's rather interesting, which is different results with different types of light guns. It's just really fascinating. Talk about that. I have, and, and this was something that came up in one of the tests we did where, where the applicant was a little confused that he was having a hard time seeing differences, in this case, between green and white lights. When I said we'd talk a little bit more about shades, for many of the pilots who do these tests, you know, a red or a white light are fairly discernible, but in some cases, a white and a green because they are both kind of a white based light and there's a green filter over the white that's getting that green it's a little bit harder to discern so for somebody who's having a color blind shading challenge they might see a brighter white and kind of a dimmer white and and to try and figure out what the difference of that is and it might mean that one one's really the white one's the green so particular applicant that we were working with said man i I see these colors perfectly fine at my home airport. So he had flown to me where I was doing a practical test that day. And at the particular airport, they had an older style incandescent light bulb set of, of light gun signals. Well, the, the newer airport tower that he had done them at previously were, were much brighter LED lights. So they're actually a green light, not a white with a filter over it in that case. And actually, I saw video evidence of that later. He called me up and said, hey, you mind if I FaceTime with you and show you like i'm seeing these colors fine here so you know in his case he's going to be working back through the medical office a little bit to figure out you know is there something he can do with that because in some places he could see it but in places that had older technology it was more of a challenge for him so you know if somebody is is doing one of these light gun signals i mean you know we always like to say set the home field advantage right figure out where you're going to do it and and check and see you might even call the tower and say hey what kind of lights do you guys have up there if we're going to be using it and figure out you know what you're really looking at well it sounds like the best advice for people who are going to take this test is to make sure that they have tried it ahead of time with a friend or an instructor or somebody before they then do it with the examiner so that you're not finding out cold for the first time whether they can do it or not as they're being tested Absolutely true. And and do it the way we're going to do it, right? I mean, so I've talked to a couple of people and they've, man, I had a hard time seeing the, the light gun signals. Last time I did it, I was at a tower and we were right below the tower. Okay, well, you know, 200 feet from the tower on the ramp is certainly different than 1500 feet away from the tower somewhere out on the airport. So make sure that you're, you're setting the test up that you're going to be taking and, and you're looking at it the same way we're going to give you the test. So don't try and, and change the parameters here. So it, it's very, very explicit how we're supposed to do this and make sure that if you are taking one of these tests, you're going to you're going to look at it the same way we're going to do it. Well, in a sense, this is really the same kind of recommendation we would give anybody who is taking a practical test, which is be prepared, figure out ahead of time what it's going to take to to pass. You know, there's no secrets. I mean, this is part of the government side of things, right? They document how we're going to do it and we follow how they do it. And But that means as an applicant for any practical test or special medical test, what we're going to do is pretty explicit. So we, there shouldn't be any surprises coming to it. Well, Jason, thanks so much for sharing all that information with us. Hopefully this is going to help a lot of people out there. I certainly hope so. And folks that need these know that you have another option now out there. If the FA is, is busy, go ahead and ask them uh, if they can designate this off to somebody who is in a pilot examiner in the area who's been trained to do it. And uh, most of the examiners in the system will do everything they can to try and help you get this done as soon as possible and get you back to flying. 
And my thanks to Jason for joining us today. You can read more of his work at jasonblair.net. You can also schedule a check ride with him there if you're in the Michigan area. And of course, I've got links to that and to his scheduling site in our show notes. Coming up next, some updates, starting off with an ATC Zero at my home airport, right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. I don't think I even knew the phrase ATC Zero until sometime last year. That's when an ATC facility, a tower, or a center basically goes off the air, either because of a storm or because of staffing issues. And we had that happen at Palo Alto on Sunday this past weekend. Now, Palo Alto is one of the busiest single runway airports in the country. They do 170,000 operations a year. That's more than San Jose International Airport. And I'm pretty proud of the folks. They did a really excellent job. Let me go ahead and play the ATIS, uh, which was on just before the tower closed at 2.30 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon, which is a very busy time. And then I'll play a little bit of the uh, air traffic control that went on around 4.15 as a large crunch of airplanes was trying to land at the same time. Sky clear, temperature 142.7, altimeter 3024, visual approach and use landing and departing runway 31. Has this weather information available on flight service frequencies? Use caution. Yes, sir, three alpha kilo on Google Contact Ground. Report. Google Contact Ground. All aircraft 5 G NOTAM in effect for Palo Alto Airport. For further information, contact flight service frequencies. Palo Alto Tower will close at 1430 local time until further notice, possibly reopening later this evening. Read back, hold short instructions in runway assignment. Advise ground control of departure. Request advise on initial contact. You have information, Tango. And now here's two minutes of audio as a non-towered airport. By the way, I did not remove any gaps. In fact, you'll notice for two minutes there hardly are any gaps. There are so many aircraft in the pattern. Set the traffic, your RV turning right base, uh, runway 31, Palo Alto. Our traffic is on nice, Lima, joining right down, and runway 31 before, uh, after 04, so Palo Alto. Yeah, now it's to Lima, do you see us directly in front of you? 172, one, one mile out. From the southeast, we'll pass over the field in our right, uh, inner tear drop for right traffic 31. Hello, Chuck. Nice, we do see uh, 04 Echo. Thank you. Set the traffic, uh, your RV over the Atlanta 31 Palo Alto. Hello, the traffic is going to be 51, this is number 2 final, behind your RV, uh, 31 Palo Alto. Palo Alto, traffic 6 flag at corner, up front 31 Palo Alto. Palo Alto traffic, system 100 Echo, turning right base 31, Palo Alto. Uh, yeah, the traffic on final uh, that is uh, before the right base, uh, on final. Traffic on right base has the traffic in final in sight, 0 for Echo. Palo Alto, uh, uh, Skyline 3, Juliet Hotel, 4 miles to the southeast, going to cross the field at 1,500, teardrop entry, right traffic, 3-1, Palo Alto. Well, the traffic, we need 5, 6, 4, 2, 3, 1,500 uh, over the field, we're going to enter uh, right 45, runway 3-1, Palo Alto, teardrop. Our traffic, that's on high, now right base, 3-1, Palo Alto. Palo Alto traffic, Skyline 5, 1, 6, Shafra is, is entering a left. Upwind, left upwind for the traffic that is turned right base. Traffic on uh, 6 Mike Echo is on right, downwind, follow it up. Have you in a sight? 6 Mike Echo. No traffic is on the mail final, 3 1 full south, hall 2. Well, I think what really made it work well is just the over-communication, and people still kept their uh, communications brief, which was great. Though I have to say, I still don't know what a left upwind is. <laughs> Obviously, in the heat of battle, it's easy to uh, to mix things up a little bit. But anyway, great job, everyone. And here's a review from Marksman42. He posted this on iTunes, the Apple Podcast app. He says, relevant, on target, no fluff. I'm not normally a podcast fan, but this one is direct with intelligent discussions that avoid fluff. The insight and topics are excellent lessons for inexperienced pilots or great reminders for more experienced pilots. Thanks for posting that. And if anybody else would like to post a review, please go ahead and do that on whatever app that you listen to the show on. Here's an email from Anonymous. He forwarded a story from the Air Current. 
And it's about a 777 incident that occurred in Dubai. It says an investigation is proceeding into an incident involving an Emirates Boeing 777 that failed to properly climb on takeoff from the Dubai International Airport on December 20th, 2021. The Emirates Boeing 777, bound for Washington, D.C., nearly rammed the ground shortly after takeoff from Dubai. The flight crew failed to set a climb properly in the flight director, a system like an autopilot, nearly plunging the aircraft into the ground shortly after takeoff. According to Flight Radar 24, Emirates Flight 231 from Dubai to Washington, D.C., suffered a potentially significant anomaly on takeoff. According to unconfirmed reports from the scene, which appear to be corroborated by data from Flight Radar 24 and other sources, the flight crew failed to fix the takeoff climb height, which was set to zero feet rather than 4,000 feet. This allegedly prompted the Boeing 777 flight director to tip the airplane back toward the ground during a critical period of flight. According to Flight Radar 24 data, the plane descended as low as 175 feet. And I went and took a look at the data as the aircraft took off when it was 1.7 miles away from the runway on the departure. It was only 175 feet. Looking at other takeoffs, typically the aircraft were around 1,500 feet at that point in time. And I read the report and it sounds like there were some non-standard procedures that were followed. First of all, the crew that previously flew the airplane set the altitude setting back to zero rather than leaving at whatever it had been set when they landed. And for whatever reason, the next crew didn't catch that. And they took off with a flight director that was going to try and send them down to basically sea level. Now, they should have been able to uh, override that and catch that if they'd been watching carefully on takeoff. But it was 3 a.m. in the morning. It was very dark. And we've talked in the past about somatographic illusion which basically is an illusion that causes airplanes to crash on takeoff if they're flying over an area that has poorly lit ground. Of course, in the daytime, that's not a problem because you see the houses and you pull back. If you see the houses getting bigger at night, you don't see that. So very, very lucky that uh, this crew caught this mistake at the very last moment. Here's an email from Cody. He says, I've been trying to take my commercial check ride since mid-December. I've had five scheduled check rides canceled in the last two months. One due to weather and four due to DPE corporate job schedule change due to COVID-related exposures affecting his availability. I have another schedule for this coming Saturday with the same DPE and then a second backup with a different DPE in a different state as a backup a week after. Having a full-time job with a family has been extremely hard to ramp up and down and take time off for prep lessons on a Friday for a Saturday check ride. Up in New England, we do not have a lot of options for DPEs. Do you have any suggestions of how to deal with ramping up and down for check rides, feel like I must not be the only person in that boat. Well, Cody, the worst I have ever heard was a gentleman in Chicago who was at a presentation I gave, and he said that he had nine check rides canceled due to weather before he was able to finally take his instrument check ride. No, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of good ideas about how to ramp up and down prior to check rides, other than the obvious, which is to try and fly and study so that your skills peak just before the check ride. But that's pretty hard to figure out how to do that, I guess, when the schedule keeps changing. Hang in there. I'm sure it will work for you. Here's an email from Tom in Maine. He says, hello, Captain Trescott. Well, that's an honorary title for sure. He says, as a proud supporter and avid listener, once again, I commend your efforts to promote safe and fun flying. I thoroughly enjoyed episode 212 and your interview with Rich Pickett of Angel Flight West. As the show progressed, I could not help but grin from ear to ear. I thoroughly enjoyed my GA flying because I'm a volunteer command pilot with a similar service, Patient Airlift Services, or PALS for short. PALS is based on Long Island, New York, but its service area is from northern Maine to Maryland and as far west as Ohio. When Rich spoke of the benefits for the passenger patients to be flown by volunteer pilot, including saving three to four hours of driving time, I couldn't help but shout out that many of our passengers at PALS are saving up to 12 hours of driving by using our services. PALS is looking for more pilots, especially in northern New England areas. May I give a shout out for PALS at palservices.org. And I think you just did, Tom. Keep up the good work, he says. Thanks for your letter, Tom. And here's a note from Michael in Pennsylvania. He says, Max, I'm wondering if you let Anonymous slip one by you in the most recent podcast. When speaking of all the mistakes you've helped him, her avoid, he or she spoke of resisting the urge to kick in a lot of rudder after overshooting the turn to final and said he, she used aileron only. Should this person perhaps be reminded that the point is to stay coordinated and avoid sharp banking low to the ground? Maybe the turns to get back on final were so shallow it didn't matter, 
uh, we don't want the message to be that you should avoid using rudder at all when you're turning. And I totally agree with you. And I do remember reading at the time and, and kind of thinking about that. Yes, anytime you're turning, you should be using some rudder. I can't really think of a good situation when you'd be using just ailerons for turns. Thanks for your note, Michael. And here's a note from Aaron in California. He says, Max, I'd like to get more insight into federal regulations surrounding the use of night vision goggles. And I think he's talking about for use in an airplane. Usually uh, NVGs are used in helicopters, but I, I think he's asking about airplanes. He said the regs appear to require special endorsement and training, and that is definitely true for helicopters, which makes sense, but also requires special avionics equipment, including a radar altimeter, which seems prohibitively expensive. I use NVGs in the cockpit, and they seem like a no-brainer safety measure for night flying. Why the radar altimeter, and where can I find NVG training and endorsement in Northern California? Why should it be so difficult to legally use this safety device while flying my small aircraft? Love the show. Thanks. And Aaron, I know very little about NVGs, but I'm sure some of our brilliant listeners do, so I'll ask you to Send me an email. You can just go out to aviationnewstalk.com, click on contact at the top of the page. And if you have an answer to Aaron's question, please let us know and I'll share it on the show. And here's a message from Patreon supporter Joe Godfrey. He says, hi, Max, just upgraded from student to first officer. That's the $20 a month level. He says, your podcast just gets better and better. Great topics, great guests, always full of useful information. There's so much content out there now, which makes your careful curation and aggregation of news even more valuable. High signal to noise ratio. I lead the IMC club at Palomar, which is an airport down in Southern California, and often steal discussion topic ideas from you. Thanks for helping keep us safe. Well, Joe, you're very welcome. And anybody who wants to is welcome to steal any of the ideas from this show to use for uh, presentations in their local clubs. And my thanks, of course, to Joe for supporting us via Patreon. Let me tell you about some of the other very special people who do that. Take a listen, see if you know any of these people. And if you do, tell them you heard their name on the show. First one is Srinivas Kedavarapu, uh, Ewan Ashley, who I just flew with today. Joe Godfrey, who edited his pledge up to $20 a month. Peter Waldschmidt, or Waldschmidt, $8. Matt Lane, $20 a month. John Johnson, $20. Alexandra Schmidt, $20. Stephen Casaza, $20. Patrick Moulin, $20. Reed Leonard, $20. And Tommy Patel, also $20 a month. And you can also contribute via PayPal. We have one person who joined us with a monthly contribution of $7 a month. That's Yulia Bugoin. And we had a couple one-time donations, which you can do through PayPal. That would include Matthew Neesom, a $25 donation, Jeffrey Schlegel, $50, and Robert Shapiro gave a full year's donation at $180. And if you'd like to go ahead and donate to the show, just head on out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, where you can sign up via Patreon, and we'll tell you all about the goodies that you get at the different uh, contribution levels. You can also become a member by going to PayPal. Just go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal to make either a one-time donation or a monthly donation. And my thanks to everyone who supports the show in whatever way you do, whether it be by leaving reviews on your podcast player app, uh, telling your friends about the show, sending us emails and comments, as well as supporting the show financially. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up.